welcome all uh, and i'm so happy today today we have uh, you know reached around 250 uh, members uh, last two webinar was uh, around 100 so i will wish uh, everyone and i'm uh, seeing that everyone is enjoying this i like to welcome uh, darren kalinan sir sir thank you very much for coming on the webinar long back i think so in 2000 when south africa team came here uh, that time sir i met you actually for the autograph uh, but i introduced myself as omtex and uh, jockstrap manufacturer and everything and then you saw the samples and you liked it and then you know you you uh, place me small uh, order and from then you uh, took me to the old south african team because you like the product i again thank you very much for the uh, appreciation and uh, respect given to my own guys and sir uh, nishad will take over from here it is time for me to introduce our celebrity speaker to the forum the batting artist mr daryl kalinan Of course, he is somebody who needs no introduction at all, as he has left us with so many wonderful memories of his classic batsmanship. But I'll do the formalities for the youngish breeding attendance on the webinar. Mr. Kalinan is a former South African player who was the centerpiece of South Africa's batting from the early to mid 90s. He played 70 Test matches with 14 centuries and 20 half centuries to his credit. As far as his ODI statistics are concerned, he has played 138 matches with three centuries and 23 half centuries to his name. He also played 12 T20 games for South Africa. He was an absolute rage when he became the youngest centurion in South Africa at the age of 16 years, as he broke the first-class record of the legendary Graham Pollock. Immediately, the schoolboy wonder was touted to be the next Graham Pollock in South Africa. In 1993, Kalinan set the South African mark for the highest first-class score, that is 337 runs not out against Northern Transvaal in 1993. His first test century was registered whilst his first tour of the subcontinent in Sri Lanka in 1993, when he cracked a hundred against Mukhtaya Murlidharan, the world's best off spinner operating on a turning track. In 1994, when South Africa was decimated by England's devastating Devon Malcolm and bowled out for 175, Daryl Kalinan made a graceful 94 and was only South African not to lose his wicket to Malcolm. At Eden Park in 1999, he edged past Pollock's highest test score of 274 by one run to claim the then South African record against New Zealand. It was indeed a diamond of an innings. He really made the number four position his own in the Proteus team. A stylish player, Kalinan played both pace and spin with equal aplomb. His silk and touch and stylish technique made batting look so very easy and pleasing to one's eyes. Kalinan had the priceless gift of timing. He made even a forward defensive fraud look so stylish. He was a fantastic flip fielder, having taken 67 catches in Test matches and 62 in ODIs. To sum it up, Kalinan was indeed one of the finest cricketing products of South Africa post apartheid era. He is now running his own signature cricket academy in South Africa since the last 16 years, focusing his energies from kids aged from 5 years to 17 years, molding, training, coaching, and showing them the way forward. He's been a consultant to the Bermuda Cricket Board and Nambia Cricket Association, and was the head coach of Kolkata Knight Riders in ICL. We are sure going to love this session as Daryl Kalinan is known to talk straight, just the way he used to play with a straight bat. Hello, Daryl. So, a warm welcome to you. Thank you, Nishad, and thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Mr. Patel. Thank you so much for both of you. In fact, for your kind words, and um, I just like to say a warm welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for considering me worthwhile to listen to. I wholly, uh, wholeheartedly respect your attendance, and I look forward to just sharing some thoughts that I might have on the game. Thank you so much, Daryl sir. We get this started. So, what do you think the global sports scene will be like post the pandemic? A lot of uncertainty shrouds us. Will cricket be the same as before? What's your take on this? Well, I think I'm like everybody else, trying to follow what. Uh, 
you know, social media or respected opinions in the media might have to say about um, this pandemic, what we're facing. I don't know, to be honest, because uh, what's emerging, let's just say, put it this way, that there's more and more data and more information and knowledge, and knowledge emerging about the, this virus and how it'll impact our lives. So I think till that point, I, I think it's probably wise not to draw any conclusions yet. We may just find that, um, I read today that it's perhaps the panic pandemic. Let's, let's pray that it's, um, you know, that we're all fine. But uh, I won't be surprised if we do get back to cricket as we know it. But I think only time can tell. Thank you, sir. Uh, what do you think the modern day cricket game has, how has the modern day, day cricket game changed in the last decade, especially so since the turn of the century? Yes, I, I think you're right in saying turn of the century. I'd go f as far back as the last uh, 20 years. Now we've seen the emergence, as we know, of T20 cricket and how that has shaped the game and how that has shaped, you know, I'm most active working with young cricketers where I prefer to be. Um, it's less complicated than the enthusiasm. I enjoy it tremendously. And now I've seen um, the, the, the impact that T20 has made, the, the globalization of so many players, the different leagues, um, everywhere you turn today, there's, there's probably cricket on television. There's so much more is written about it. And it definitely has changed in that regard. I think the, the attributes to become a good player, the requirements, the demands on international cricketers, I, I think it's greater now than ever before. You know, I started in an era in, in 1980, our first class career. We were very much uh, amateurs and then went through a stage of being professional amateurs, amateur professionals, and by the late 90s became... We could class only then sort of consider ourselves true professionals. But um, it's opened up in the last 10 years, I would say, uh, cricket very much as a career. I'm seeing younger children deciding on cricket as a career, you know, setting their sights out and the influence of so much information has definitely impacted not only on, on young cricketers, but, but all of us, coaches as well. Yeah. Thank you, sir. In the last century, a professional player was much on his own in terms of not much coaching on tour, no video analysis, no trainer, no injury management awareness, no nutritionist or dietitian, no man-to-man -man management. But today, the whole scenario has changed. Do you think this is indeed helping the players put their best foot forward? I think it does. I think that we mustn't be neglectful of all the wisdom and value that, we, that we've gained over so many years. And all those that have had a story to tell that started their career in that sort of era. I mean, I, in 1980, odd, uh, we didn't do warm-ups. Um, I was playing you know, in a very strong first-class structure in South Africa. We had a coach. Um, and then someone decided it, uh, in playing in England that what we should do is um, uh, do this was only for, for one day cricket, so we went around a few months with that and we, we, we started to follow a bit of a stretching routine. Um, in the late, once we got back into international cricket, um, Bob Wilmer became our coach and Bob was uh, very forward thinking in the way that he approached the game, how we prepared and what we needed to be doing. And it was probably about 94, 95, we were the first team in world cricket that introduced a trainer. Uh, Paddy Upton came on board. A uh, travelling trainer, when I say that, he, he toured with us. A physiotherapist. We had a physiotherapist for the, for the first time, full time. And then we started to look uh, very deeply into our preparation and whatever methods were, were available then. Now, today, those squads um, and people, the support staff, are just as important as the players. And, and some, some countries, um, that support staff would run into eight, nine, ten sort of people. So... Each are, are specialists in the field, as we know. Um, and I think there's been a, a very much a sci new scientific approach. We saw the emergence of sporting, if I could call it sporting scientists, in fields, as you mentioned, which weren't before really considered important nutrition, recovery training. I think those, those methods have really um, gone a long way, particularly in the last sort of 10 years. But nothing beats experience. Nothing beats the basics. And I'm just concerned that we don't see enough. I think we need a better balance of uh, what, what we know from the past. That intellectual property and that value is enormous, particularly from those that have been there, that they've done it, and they've done it for a very long time. So I think we are going to a period now where we've seen the, the value of that, and the introduction of that is very important back, 
back into our cricket across various uh, countries. Particularly in South Africa, we've neglected that with the appointment of a guy like Graham Smith and guys who you know, value the input of the past. We're trying to recapture and reintroduce a lot of that intellectual property back into oh. our game. <laughs> that was really insightful, sir. It is a Thank fact you. of the matter that uh, most players from the subcontinent struggle to cope up with the bouncing and the swimming pitches in Chile, where the outside is subcontinent. And players from South Africa, Australia, and England are not at their best playing on flat, dry turners in humid conditions in the subcontinent. How can the players from both parts of the world neutralize this aspect and be at their best in either condition? Well, I think the, there's a few reasons for that. You, you need to genetically look at um, the, the type of cricketers that you produce in. We're all different, um, a lot of stronger, a lot more nimble, a lot of different builds, a lot of different strengths and weaknesses. And, and over time, we play to those. You have to look at the nature of the pitches. I mean, in India, you get a lot of the clay surfaces. In, in Australia and South Africa, you get that black bully, which that and a different grass covering. So that leads to how the ball and the pitch behave. So when you grow up with that, in the various conditions so your game starts to take shape and that's how your game is uh, that's what your game is built around and i'm a great believer by between the ages of 10 and 13 is the best time to consolidate any young player's technique that basis the foundation has to be set by then so even by then already they've developed the game around dealing with different conditions I'll, I'll put it to you this way when we first went to the subcontinent we had your traditional english bats with the with a flat face and this, the sweet spot at the back was a lot higher. But because of the less bounce and the turning ball, uh, we found it difficult to get the ball away, just get it into the gaps past the bowlers. Then we realized we need to look at our equipment. So the Indian players and, and the, the Sri Lankan players, I, mean, I remember um, Aravinda De Silva picking his bat up. And the sweet spot was completely in the toe, and it had that bow, which is almost standard now. So we had to learn to adapt in that sort of sense and become more risky. But... Like anything, the more we played there, the more we got knowledgeable about it, the more we got smarter about what we need to be doing and how to cope and how to play. It's a discussion I had with Raul Dravid in the late 90s. And when he was in South Africa, we ran into each other at the Wanderers. I said to him, well, um, you guys all come here, subcontinent players with these big bats, and you're trying to hook Alan Donald and Farney de Villiers, and you slow, you, you slow on the shot, you, your hands are a lot low because that's how you used to play you haven't really got back and you splice in it and out you go. So you need to think about coming when you come to South Africa, um, looking at lighter bats that give you a higher sweet spot because that's where the ball meets the bat uh, much better. And wasn't it a year or two later and that I read an interview, you said that that was something that they thought about um, when they were touring these parts of the world. But I, I've, I've wondered why, now maybe it's an agricultural thing you can't do it. Why don't countries build uh, pitches with soil and grass, whether that the soil would be fine, whether the grass would grow in different climates. So you learn from a young age to practice on the South African wicket, Australian wicket similar, an English pitch because they had different grass, and then you learn to play on the subcontinent pitch. And I still remember thinking this was a good idea and going to, I think it was the, 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 the Wankedi Stadium, and I asked the groundsman for a packet of typical pitch soil, and I took it home to South Africa, and I thought, well, couldn't I please find a groundsman where um, we could prepare a pitch like this? Because we never grew up on a turning pitch. We never, our games weren't built to cope with that. But a lot of that knowledge, yes, it has come back, and players have gone back to the subcontinent. Uh, there was a time where we weren't good in the subcontinent, but then who was? Um, so that knowledge has gained. But I think a lot of it has to do with the conditions, the environment, what you're used to, and how your game, your game is shaped around it and how you take that on later into your career. But you can be proactive about it, just some smart thinking and try to replicate um, uh, conditions. Yeah, with that answer, you've given us so much food for thought. Thank you so much. Today's batsman is more into power hitting than sublime batsmanship with deft touch. It was always such a great sight to watch batsmen like Bal Richards, Viv Richards, David Gar, Mark Waugh, yourself, Gundapa Vishwanath, VVS Lakshman, Mohammad Azuruddin, Damien Martin, Jay Vardana, and of course today's Rohit Sharma. Watching such batsmen is like witnessing an artist creating a masterclass. Do you think this breed is starting to get extinct and that we need more of them? 
I think it's a fair point. Um, there are one or two players. I think of a guy like Kane Williamson, who Joe Root, who would fit into that that sort of um, uh, way of playing. Um, I think one or two players in the Indian top order. My explanation, and I went through the list before this discussion, um, I think it, quite a bit of it has to do with technique. All those players, the majority of them had the, the way that we were all traditionally taught with the, with the bat down next to the toe. And then you had this sort of graceful, easy lower back lift. And the game was played a lot closer to the body. Strength and power wasn't the requirement you could get by with a solid technique in your old traditional sense. Today, the game has become about power. It is about strength. It's about speed. And we've seen a batsman emerge with these big, heavier bats, these premeditated back lifts before the ball's even bowled, where the bats are upright, and they're going at the ball because that, that, that's, the, that's the requirement. But it's leaving them um, troubled when it comes to test cricket where the ball's moving around. I don't think they have that ability with the lower hands, the softer hands, the lighter bats, to be able to be more graceful at the crease. And so we're either seeing all or nothing, particularly in test cricket. We've seen scores where guys are, are left wondering. I mean, because it was very significant that Justin Langer last year made the comment that when the ball's moving around, what concerns him the most, whether it's through the air off the pitch, that the Australian batsmen don't have the technique to cope. And I, I think with the, you know, when I, when I started my career, you made a white ball cricketer out of a red ball cricketer. Today, the challenge is you're trying to make, a, coaches are trying to make a red ball cricketer out of a white ball cricketer. And so there's been this, this hybrid sort of player that's emerging that in certain circumstances is, is powerful and strong, but in certain stance, uh, circumstances, he doesn't have the game to cope. And that, I think, is a big challenge for coaches and players where they can effortlessly move, I'm talking about batsmen, between all three formats, formats on a daily sort of basis. But that, that emphasis has gone there. I see it uh, with kids especially. I can understand we coach today with the premeditated back lift. I don't like the idea of it being too high because that's a natural progression when you want to hit the ball. But, um, you know, that's the bats are definitely heavy. I used it 2-6, 2-7. And they don't even make bats like that. So getting the bat up early, just from a strength point of view, certainly does help their technique. But I, I think the time is, is probably gone where we won't see a lot of that sort of batsmanship anymore. Um, that's just the demands of the game and, and how the players are playing and how they're being taught. Yeah, thank you so much. That was really straight from his heart. Now, sir, this uh, game can be very cruel. This is a very stressful game and so many players buckle under pressure. Mental health is the most ignored problem in world cricket right now. It is great that the debate has at least begun as a few international stars have, stars have started to speak on this. What is your take on this? I think it's important. I think it's important probably in all sports. Um, sportsmen generally are under pressure to have that sort of macho image about themselves and performing and always tough and, and, and never vulnerable. So I, I do think that it, it's good that it is being addressed. I a great believer, and I think there should be mental screening of any of all young professionals. I think it's for their own benefit getting to understand themselves a lot better because that's also just as big a challenge as the game itself. It helps the team, it helps the coaches. So it leads to greater understanding of who you are and what you're doing. And I'm, I, when I work oh. with young kids, I believe from the age of ten years old, you know, they they should be introduced to basic mental skills, um, mental training, um, understanding, not being scared to be vulnerable about your fears um, and the difficulties that you face. I mean, cricket is a tough game. It's a mental grind. So much goes into cricket and in many ways, particularly batting, I'd say it's an individual game. So we must always be mindful of the support structures around them. And I think this is where coaches and families do come in. And I, I, towards middle, most of, well, from the start, but towards the middle end of my career, realized the importance of having a support structure around you. You can go to your family with something. You can go and see somebody else. Your, your uh, a, a, a psychologist, a sports psychologist can offer you something. Your best friend offers you something. Your own coach offers you something. 
as long as you have a sounding board where you can share your emotions honestly and openly and, and you can trust people, I would greatly encourage all young cricketers to think about the game like that. Because cricket, you know, you're dealing with failure more than success. It's just the nature of the game. And cricket attracts a certain personality because not everybody likes that. You have to have that this particular makeup, I believe, to be a, a successful cricketer. Thank you so much, uh, Daryl, sir. And uh, thanks for those lovely insights. And I'm pretty much sure that everyone has warmed up. And now it's time to take a few questions uh, from our students directly. The first caller of the day will be Puru Singh from Gurga. Can you please unmute yourself, Puru Singh, and please go ahead with your question for Daryl, sir. Hi, good afternoon, Daryl, sir, and good afternoon, Good afternoon, everyone. Puru. Thank you, Vijay, sir, for giving all of us an opportunity. Uh, thank you, Vijay, sir, for giving us this uh, wonderful opportunity. So without wasting my uh, any time, uh, Daryl, sir, I have just one question for you, and which is, like, uh, I played cricket at the oh, state boy. level, and I, of course, like everyone else, I've been, uh, like everyone else, I've also spent a lot of uh, hours uh, during my childhood days. So what I have come to realize is that while a lot of things have changed at the international level, as far as equipment and technology uh, is concerned, not much has come down to the grassroots. Of course, equipment has come down, but not much uh, advancement has been made for the grassroots level. So I you know, just want to know what's your take to it. I think it's, it's, it's important as much information as possible that we can get and, and help to influence young emerging cricketers. I, I would imagine you're probably you know, talking about cricketers from the age of about 8 to, to 15, 16, 17. I think by 17, they're probably at a stage now where they know what they want to do, whether that's play cricket or not. Um, I don't think we need to look to be too fancy about it. Um, you know, there's, there's so much available online. Um, I use a simple method. I've worked with kids. I use WhatsApp. I use WhatsApp because of its convenience. I use it because of the video chat features, the chat features, and then it's phone to phone. So it's very mobile, mobile centric. But to, you know, at that sort of age, uh, particularly to the age of 12, I think we must not forget the importance of basics. As much as the game may change and the influence of um, so much else, uh, the formats, there's a lot of kid if he's talented and he's hardworking enough. There's still a lot at a later stage which he can add to his game. And it's a continual struggle as, as a coach. And I'm, I know you experience it because kids, are, they see um, a particular style of cricket being played and at 80 wants to, to, to learn the reverse sweep and the ram shot. And parents will put the kid, they put coaches under pressure to, to you know, have this sort of game that they see often. And he's not ready for it. He's not ready emotionally for it. He's not physically ready for it. So whilst we, we feel under pressure as coaches that we need to be offering so much, and, more, and parents and kids feel the more you have to offer, the more you have to speak, and the more you have to introduce, it makes you a better coach. But often in the process, simple basics are forgotten. And I go back to that, and I always encourage the coaches that I speak to, and I know, and I know it's a continual battle. I had it as well. There's a time and place for everything. If the Kriegers have become a good cricketer, you can learn that in a heartbeat. But you cannot go back. And I think that age is 12, 13. You then started to learn to uncoach a child how to do basics. You know how tough that is because their habits are set in form. And I would, even with all of that, I would encourage you not to get too carried away with technology and the requirement. To have the strength of belief that you know that learn the solid basics of, of how to stay at the crease, defend well, and the game can be built around a few shots and as they go on. But I think you can be innovative. I think distance learning, online learning, mobile apps, cheap drawing tools. I use a $7 drawing tool to, to, to do my analysis with voiceovers. And I think that that's, it's proved to be very successful. So more is not often better. It's less than what you're doing well. And back yourself to believe in the basics. That kid one day will turn around and thank you for that. When he's older, you'll appreciate that. Thank you, Daryl Sal, and thanks, Puru Singh, for staying connected. The Thank next you, caller of the day is Aman Sharma from Mumbai. Aman, are you there? Yeah. So my question is, uh, how should I condition myself to concentrate ball by ball to build my innings as a frontline batsman? Thank you, Aman. That's a that's a good question. That because you know, batting. I'll give you an example. Uh, 
Nishad mentioned the I batted for 12 hours with that South African score the highest then was 275 um, and we batted to the close of play on the next day and there was obviously cricket the next day and then after that I got a, a condensed version of that innings and so the full range of the 12 hours ball to ball was 16 minutes of where it was ball to ball so in between all of that overnight the breaks there there had to be you know concentration is limited and concentration is a source of energy it's a power in you so you need to you need to be able to know how to preserve that and how to turn it on and how to turn it off and um, all batsmen are facing their fears and their doubts even while you're at the crease and as an opening batsman it's uh, as a frontline batsman, it's not easy, particularly you against a new ball and someone's trying to hurt you as well. And there's, there's a lot that, to be going on. And to summarize it simply, you know, there's, the, there's the controllables and the uncontrollables. So you need to identify what are the controllables. And Steve Waugh used to talk about that the man on his shoulder was constantly in his ear, who was uh, reminding you about your doubts. So you need to have distraction methods. You need to start on a distraction method the moment that you're facing uh, that negative talk or your fears or your doubts or concerns, scoreboard pressure or where you are and how you're coping are starting to take over. And then a concentration routine. What do you do after the ball's bowled? You see some players have methods. I had a little inscription on my glove, which reminded me of key things like head stuff and focus on the ball because you can't have more than two or three thoughts at most. And this is why when I ask players, why do you practice? They say, well, I want to be better. When I say, if you're practicing, you're practicing that certain things become second habit and second nature. You shouldn't be worried about where your stump is because you practice that. So you left to just work on what you can focus on at the top as a frontline batsman or the controllables. Key thoughts, how to switch on, switch off. You don't entirely switch off. How to use those breaks that your energy can be revitalized. So you can decide on a routine which you know eliminates or distracts you from a negative to a positive. That may be a mantra. It may be a, a switch off thing that you have that you perhaps look at the scoreboard, which tells your mind, I've switched off. And it's the next ball again, because you can't get too heavily involved. And you need to practice like that. That's why I love to practice against two bowlers. I've practiced my concentration routines in the next, in the nets, because things become habit, you take it out into the middle. So I think it starts how you practice, how you prepare, how you think, how you visualize, what are your key thoughts? What are your concentration routines between balls? How do you deal with breaks? What do you spend time thinking about when the non-strikers end? Because energy is a wave. Uh, concentration is an energy. It's a wave. It comes and goes. And how you deal with the distractions. But overriding, think about the controllables and think about the uncontrollables. There's nothing you can do about them. Yeah. Those were indeed golden words, a great piece of advice. I'm sure it's going to benefit a lot on the forum. The next caller of the day is a very promising young opening batsman from Sixth Academy, Bangalore, Abhijit. And he's got a question for Daryl, sir. Over to Abhijit. Hi, sir. So my question is regarding the cricket bats. So how do you think it evolved from the time you played to how, it, how the cricket bats are now? And also, do you think the new ICC restrictions on the bad dimensions will provide some respite for the bowlers, especially in white ball cricket? I, I don't think so. I'm, I didn't agree with the decision to make the bat smaller. I think we needed to think about how we could uh, even level things out for the bowlers. Look, we had very light bats. Uh, you've seen all the pictures, those traditional thin sort of bats. Uh, they didn't really have the bows in. We got, the, as I said earlier, the typical English-made bats without the bows that we didn't understand where the sweet spot was and how it could affect you in different conditions. And we learned that when we were exposed to those, to those conditions. But I think what we forget is two things. I think the players of today are a lot stronger. Our gym routines was not part of our routine. Um, it was the odd exceptional guys. So I think they've got stronger generally all around, particularly in their forearms. Um, and the ability to handle those big bats. It's led to, I think, more right-hand dominance. Yes, at times you need that. Um, but um, I, I, as I said, I didn't agree with the... the um, it's a progression in the game. Um, why do we want to try and hold, hold the game back? But the downside is cricket can only be made out of willow because you've got the ball factor. Um, so it hasn't seen the, 
the growth in other sports like golf where you've got composite materials to, to make up the shaft, the, the head of the golf club. So it's made, um, made it interesting in that sort of regard. But I think it's had its, it's, had its positives, but I, I don't think it's really helped a defensive technique. But that's, that, that's where the game's struggling at the moment. So, um, and the other, the second thing that I wanted to mention, we see it more spoken about in one-day cricket. And I think the best thing that ever happened for batting in one-day cricket was two balls, two hard new balls. The ball wasn't going to swing much, and certainly in one-day pitches wasn't going to go off. The, the seam was going to particularly cook a bar after 25 overs, it's gone. But I know from experience, having used a very light bat, 2627, a hard cook a bar, I could clear the rope. I felt confident, but I know so many times I really felt I did it well. We, we were using one ball. It got softer and scuffed. It was very difficult. Now, these days, Lance Kluzner in our time was ahead of his time. He used this massive, massive heavy bat. I was just saying, how can you possibly pick this bat up? But, um, you know, now today, a lot of that sort of, that sort of stuff's a very much standard. So I think the ball is going so much further because of, because of it being hard. Players stronger. Yes, the bats are bigger. And there's more behind it. The, the, the middle's the middle, but I think it's the, I mean, you would know as a player that your, the, the, the edges seem to fly a bit longer, or seem to go a bit more wide or, or a little bit further. Thanks, Daryl, sir. Thanks, Abhi. Thank you. May I now invite, yeah, may I now invite Karan Soda from Mumbai to put forward this question to Daryl, sir. Mr. Karan, are you there? Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Omtex, for giving me an opportunity to ask a question to Daryl, sir. My question to sir is, if a batsman is timing the ball well in nets, but not able to score run in matches, how does he fix this problem? Well, is he practicing the same net area, the same sort of surface? Once you play in matches, you then, um, we know you move around, you have Probably different surfaces, different pace of the pitch, uh, different um, bounce as well. So that can impact your ability to time the ball. It's about also on the day managing that. If Are you saying that if he's um, connecting the ball well in nets, what's, is he always facing the new uh, older ball? Perhaps he should make it more difficult for himself, take on a new ball. And, you know, certain basics like ball striking, like a position where he's standing still from a solid base, hitting the ball late, hitting the ball under the eyes. So you always want that contact area there. A lot of top hand sort of work. And an encouragement from the coach to maybe just get that back lift a bit lower and work on timing, working, caressing on the ball. I'm a great believer you, you can start with a lot of underarm throws, top hand work, and then increase those underarm throws. So that it becomes a natural rhythm and flow. You know, it's easy in the next... It, it may be that once he gets in the middle, it just tightens up a little bit. Might be restricted physically. So breathing is a massive, sorry, in the concentration question earlier, I didn't mention the impact, the massive impact of breathing. Breathing oxygen to the brain, there's no doubt you think clearer. So it, that may be impacting, his game may tighten up. So I think it's, the, it's also the knowledge of saying, look, no two innings, as I can assure you, um, and I'm no far better players than me would agree that no two innings were the same. You're always having to adjust, find a way, think about the you know certain things that can help you with the timing. Go back to those basics, and then as you go along, there's probably two matches a season, three matches uh, a season where you could sit down and say, you know what, I hit that ball like I wanted to hit it today. I got one of my best Test hundreds against England at the Wanderers in Johannesburg. The ball was going around a bit and it was a young Flintoff um, was bowling. And I've often asked about that in because I think it was the best one I ever played. And I can remember one shot I hit out the middle off him through the covers for four. The rest of the time, it, it's a constant battle. But the smart find a way. So you've got to work with what's happening on the day instead of being frustrated and saying, well, I know I'm hitting it well. That's why I don't... I'm not I'm not a great fan of the bowling machine. It's easy. Guys feel I'm playing well because they're on the bowling machine. Hit in a bit, but you know where the ball's going. Give me a bowling machine today and you'll swear I never gave up. You know what I mean? So I would look at high practices, techniques to improve timing. Is it too much on the bowling machine? And then having a mindset to say, fine, I need to work with what's happening on the day. And then to see where that would, would, would get the batsman. 
thanks so and much thank you so thank you so much uh, karan bhai do stay connected with umtech this is a fantastic session as we are getting to pick one of the smartest brain in world cricket that is daril kalinan the next caller of the day is a 16 year old cricketer from roha amol gore are you there do we have yes, sir. Uh, hello sir yeah, amol please go ahead with your question yeah you audible sir myself anmol gore first of all good afternoon sir Uh, I am from Desha Cricket Academy in Roha City. So, sir, my question was that we have scored total number of seventeen centuries in international cricket, and from this there would be some cases of you were on ninety nine means on ninety nine runs, and for getting that turn, how did you handle the pressure, and how did you maintain yourself mentally for getting that single run? I think the it goes back to you deciding on your routines for every ball. how you practice them how you take them into the middle and how you deal with what's happening around you and you have methods to say no and you can focus on the controllable so whether you on 1 or 99 or 199 your thought process shouldn't change um i know in one day cricket it's a slightly different because there's scoreboard pressure the game's going in the direction you might be in the 90s have to be going after it and in the in the process you lose your wicket so i think it's 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 the ability to say fine it's as if it was i'm on 10 99 or 199 i still follow my routines my processes and what's keeping me in the middle and that's something you can work with your coach on you can find something to experience or work with you i'll tell you what i did was to help me i didn't take 50 as a benchmark i took i took uh, 30 during those first 30 runs you at the crease for an hour hour and a half i then shifted the, the 50 focus I made it 75. I said no 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 if I get to 75 that for me is my 50. So I went through 50 no problem. And then my next focus instead of 100 I made it 130 not that I got there often. But again it was how I was conditioning my mind to think. So 100 wasn't a milestone for me. Cuz then most most wicket most guys after they've got to 100 the most wickets fall between 100 and 110. Look at your where you play your cricket. Look at international cricket. Look at domestic cricket. Most time, when a guy gets to 100, he falls between 100, 110. So that's a danger period, as much as getting to 100. So I shifted my focus 130. Most guys, when they, a lot of guys, when they get beyond 130, generally you've got the bowlers on their knees. You sort of tend to coast through, and then you're setting yourself up getting closer to 200. So you can shift, condition your mind to think differently about it through your routines. and you can shift it maybe to say fine instead of 50 my benchmark is 60 and i want to get to 110 is my 100 cuz if you get through 110 you probably got a good chance and then you start to get big hundreds big hundreds are 130 plus how many guys in your cricket score 100 every weekend go and look at the score cards how many get 130 140 how many get 150 those scores make selectors sit up and take notice this guy got 150 plus this guy got 130 plus Hundreds is probably ten you do it every weekend. I don't know how big your cricket is, so you need to condition your mind to think differently about those those uh, landmarks. Cricket may say it's fifty or hundred, but what do you say it is? So Amol, I think uh, you should be more than satisfied with that piece of advice from Daryl sir, and please uh, make sure you score quite a few centuries the coming season. The yes, next caller of so. the day. is a 13 year old cricketer from navi mumbai gandhar kachre gandhar are you there uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to ask question to uh, daryl sir good sure. uh, first of all good uh, good afternoon sir good afternoon so my question is uh, what should be the mindset while playing fast uh, fast bowlers who bowl short balls on grassy pitches Well, you need to be. This is one of the defining things for any batsman, whether you whether you young batsman like you, whether you first class cricketer, whether you international cricketer. And you know, Graham Thorpe, who's the England batting coach, and I agree with him wholeheartedly when he say the short ball, because of the intimidation factor, the physical factor, shapes your game. It shapes your game in many other ways. So you see trigger movements. You see those who like to hang back. Those who like to play from the crease, because it's the fear factor, the thing of getting hurt. Now often when a young cricketer gets hit thankfully he's not hurt badly he understands first of all that wasn't too bad maybe it was just like a bad beasting so you need to work out how you practice 
You need to be able to, to attack the short ball when you want to, depending on the state of the ball and the type of bowler. And you need to be in a position where you don't want to attack the short ball. You're in. The, the, it's a new ball. The guy's quite quick. You're not comfortable against this. But it's what the short ball does to the rest of your game, which is something you need to think about as well. Because it's an intimidating factor to stop you moving your feet. The follow-up ball, you might pitch it a bit fuller. They may have a plan to do that. But you, importantly, need to be confident. You need to be sure that you can defend the short ball. You can leave the short ball. And you can get forward and you get back in the cross into line. So you can start maybe with a tennis ball. You can start with a tennis ball. Um, no, you don't need any protection. You just get on a surface outside and get someone to mix it up. So you learn to use your feet backwards and forwards. You're able to drop your hands. You're able to get out the way. You can then, you can then take it further to a hard ball. And a lot of cricketers don't like to, when they practice, be put out of their comfort zone. You can actually ask the bowlers, because one of the things the batsmen say, oh, but I'm going to get hurt. Well, you're going to get hurt in any case if you don't practice. But the real thing is, if you give the bowlers, say to them, bowl short at me. I saw Mornay Morkel once do that because A.B. de Villiers asked him in the nets. He said to Mornay, I want you to try and hurt me. Bowl short, bowl fast, bowl quick. I tell you, one session like that, your confidence is enormous as a batsman. So you need to face it. You need to practice against it. And you need to have the skills to deal with it. If you overcome that and become good at that, trust me, grassy pitch any sort of situation. And it doesn't disrupt the rest of your game. You'll become a fine batsman because that's where often it's the Achilles heel of too many batsmen and leads to some to so many talented kids. But when they get into the higher grades, they can't deal with pace bowling and eventually they fall away. Thank, Thank you, sir. Sir. The next uh, caller for the evening is Martin Suji. Just uh, last two, three questions for Daryl, sir. Over to Martin Suji. Yes, good afternoon, Daryl. How are you? Well, and you, thanks, Martin. Yes, my two questions are, I just want to ask two very quick questions to you. Yes, uh, Martin. How does an introvert player affect the team spirit inside a changing room, whether positively or negatively? And uh, so my last question is, I mean, so what is the difference between, I mean, changing room pressure and the scoreboard pressure in a team? I think the, look, at, I would, would have considered myself as an introvert. Um, we're all different. But I think any team, the values of the team are very important. And those values need to be respected by all. You know, I've often said to players, well, what do you want more in a team? Do you want everybody to be liked and best friends? Or do you want everyone to respect each other? I've never played in a team where everyone has loved everyone. I've never played in one. Maybe everyone didn't like me. But I think it's, you know, you, you're throwing together a squad of 15 people and coaches. We're all from different backgrounds. Some are more highly strong. You, I know you've played cricket, Martin. And yeah. um, I'm sure you would agree with me. But I think the overriding principle is that as long as it's not destructive, I think a destructive force, no matter what that talent and ability is, needs to be addressed. And I think this is where the captain, the team, the coach come in. Because there need to be levels of respect. And I think everyone... Can't be like everybody else, but we all make up a team. But there are certain levels and standards because under pressure, a team that everyone loves each other will fall apart. I may not like you, but if I respect you, I will work with you. And I think that is the difference. So rather give me a team where there's, it's built on respect. It's not built around only certain personalities because we're all different. And I think that's where the management style of the coach, the captain, and as players. But the moment you lose respect, and some are treated differently, some are viewed differently, and a certain dynamics become destructive. That cannot be at the expense of a respectful, harmonious working environment. Because under, under, when, under respect, when you're under pressure, you will pull together as a team. Uh, your second question, Martin, uh, sorry, was that scoreboard pressure versus team pressure? Yes, yes, sometimes, uh, I mean, I'm talking from a coach's perspective. That yes. um, do you tell, I mean, your players to put, I mean, pressure to the, I mean, opposition with the scoreboard pressure or making them have, yes, a changing room pressure. So which, so, I mean, yes, what are the difference? Are you talking, so as a team, what you put pressure you put on the opposition or what you feel in yes. as a team? Yes, whichever, whichever way you, yeah. you can answer me. 
scoreboard pressure is a real thing. Um, and why do you, you know, if you unpack it all and say, right, why is this scoreboard pressure? Obviously, we're not getting wickets, we're not getting runs. Why aren't we doing that? So we don't, don't we have the skills to get us, are we not in that situation, first of all? Or do we have the skills to get ourselves out of that situation? And I'm a great believer in skills. Skills comes before experience. Give me a, give me a, a less experienced but skillful player. I always go for the skillful player. So what has got us into that situation? How do we get ourselves out of that situation? But that's, you know, that's the beauty. That's the beauty of cricket is that it's, it's, it, there's so many facets to it. And I think expecting that and how we communicate, how some players deal with that, the comments they make, the energy they give off, it comes down to, again, what are our values as a team? What do we feel? And how do we convey that? You don't want a batsman coming in, struggling, throwing his bat down and say, no one's going to get a run yet today. Or you know what, it's this or it's that or whatever. So I think you, you address that and understand and get buying from everybody. And you all make mistakes. Let's put what needs to be put in its place. Let's have a view about it all. We can discuss it. But I think the first thing to tackle is why have we got into that situation? How do we get out of it? Have we got the necessary skills? Because it, invariably, if you don't, it'll blow up in one form or the other. And you'll find yourself, you know, struggling to uh, be competitive. Thank you very Thanks, much. Martin, Thanks, Martin, sir. Thanks, Daryl. Pleasure, sir. Martin. Thank you. Now we're taking the final caller of uh, the day today. And uh, may I invite Sarabjit Singh, uh, a promising coach from Mumbai, to please put forward his question. Sarabjit Singh. Hello. I'm audible. Hi. Yes, please go ahead. Hello, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Good evening. Hello, Sarabjit. How are you? I'm fine, sir. So my question is, what should be the mindset of a batsman when walking to bat? And also how to teach the students during the practice session uh, as the situ situation in practice and match situation is different. Yes, that, that's, that's one of the big challenges of cricket is that and I say to young players that, um, you know, how you, how you practice is how you will play. Don't kid yourself. You think you can practice in one way and you're going to play in another way. You need to know what you're practicing for. And this is the challenge. Have I got time cricket to deal with? Have I got limits? Have I got 50 over cricket? Have I got T20 cricket? So most young cricketers are playing 50 cricket, I would imagine. Certainly we do, yeah, and the odd occasion they play time cricket. And the problem with the nets is you maybe have two net sessions a week and you bat for 15 minutes. And I see young players try to, try to play a four-hour innings in 15 minutes and they get out too often. So I say, well, you know what? Go find an, find an environment to throw down the bowling machine or take one bowl aside and practice one shot or practice particular routine. But when you have a net session, you can, what, are you, what are you doing? Even the 50 over, what are you doing most of all? You're having to defend your wicket. You're having to at times leave. So why not take 15 minutes, I walk out of there and I'm better for the experience. And I remember the very first cricket book I read, one of the earliest, Greg Chappell. I know it's a different game then, because we're preparing different now. Batsmen for a whole lot. They've got so much more to deal with. But it said, don't get out in the nets. If you don't get out in the nets, that's worth gold. You work, you, it, it's the habit that you inculcating mentally about what, how, you want to, how you want to develop your game. If you have a particular throwdown, there, practice that. Look, I played a long time, and I focused more on test cricket than anything else. And... I was the first player in world cricket in about 97, 98. They wrote me back in for the 99 World Cup where I said, I'm not playing one day cricket. I wasn't converting in test cricket. I was playing well below what I should be playing. And I said, for three years, I'm going to practice one way. And my routines are going to be the same, good or bad, good or bad, success or failure. And then I knew what I had to, I knew what I had to uh, uh, check myself with things weren't going well and when things were going well I knew what I had to check myself against and I developed those habits that became part of my life and in, in, in the way that I practiced and then when I retired in 2000 I had the best conversion rate better than Lara better than Tim Dawkins in test cricket and that, that was the benefit I don't know how it survived today I've got to get through T20 I've got to get through 50 over I've got to get through test cricket and only two players in my humble opinion in the last 10 years have been successful in that we, we haven't seen periods periods of dip in their form has been virat and ab all the others have had their moments with that battle 
Williamson, Joe Root, you know, of, of the top five or six players. So practice, treat it specially, have a clear idea what you want to practice, know what you want to practice. If you want to practice your power hitting, set aside power hitting, have your little throwdowns. But I would treat, if you only got 15 minutes, at least have one objective. I'm not just going to get out. So when you leave that net practice, you feel you've achieved something. How many times you walk out of a net session, you bat it, and you feel worse about your game? <laughs> That's not a good idea. That's not a good idea. So be smart, man, and think about, you should arrive at a practice prepared about, you know what you're going to expect. You must arrive prepared. How am I going to go about my, and your coach should come over to you, especially if you're a talented player of the future and say to you, you know, um, what are you planning to do today? I know everything can't work to a sheet. That's the nature of cricket. And I, I want to deal with cricket as a batsman. They say to me, right, I've got this in mind. And I'd like that. And I'd like this. And I want that. I know it's not easy. Because you've got a net situation. But for young cricketers, my, my biggest advice, every time you're batting the nets, don't get out. Thank you so much. So that pretty much was the final question for the day. Thanks, uh, Daryl Kalinan, sir. Vijay, sir, would you like to thank Daryl, sir? Vijay, sir? Yeah, there is a lot of things uh, still there. Party Patel's yeah. is there. So, sir, sir, because Kalinan, sir, has to go for other meetings. So, he is leaving, but there are many things to, uh, still pending. So, uh, don't uh, leave this uh, webinar. Yeah. There are many things happening in the next 30 minutes. And Kalinan, sir, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure, man. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, it will be a great help. Thank you. I hope so. And I hope to do it again. Sorry, I've, I've actually got another webinar with... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when you have a chance, we, we'll do one more time, yeah? yeah we'll do it again. I, I, my webinar is with an Indian company called Notebook. So I'm not... Yeah, yeah. They've asked me just to talk about the holistic development of, of children. So wish me luck. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Okay, all the best, sir. All the best. Thank you to Thank everybody. You so much and all the best, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.